Welcome to this tutorial in business ethics. I'm uh, John Hooker. I'm on the faculty of the Tepper School of Business at Carnegie Mellon University. And I'm here to tell you a little bit about how to analyze an issue in business ethics. That's the approach I'm going to take. Now, people come to an ethics class with many different expectations. So what can you expect from me? I'm going to present to you a framework for analyzing an ethical issue that's based on the idea that an ethical choice is a rational choice, a logical choice. By rational, I don't necessarily mean rational self-interest. Rational choice is a broader idea than that. You may ask, how so? Well, stay tuned. And I'm going to provide you a number of real-life case studies in which we'll apply these ideas to get some practice, 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 because that's how you learn. Okay, so here's the outline. I'm going to begin by saying something about why we have ethics, what's it for, and get past some misconceptions we have about the field, get in our way. Then I'm going to present to you 23 centuries of ethical thought in about 45 minutes in two sessions. So wish me luck. Then after that, the fun begins. I'm going to show you how to apply these ideas to real life dilemmas. That's the plan. To begin with, why do we have ethics? Let me say it first, that I'm not here to convince you to be ethical. That's not my job. That's not the job of ethics. I'm going to assume that you want to be ethical. It's the same if you go to finance class, for example. If you go to finance class, the instructor doesn't try to convince you to make money. The instructor assumes you want to make money and tries to tell you how. Now, there is this idea out there that people act in their self-interest. People don't really want to be ethical necessarily. Uh, this is a very popular view, but I have to tell you, it's false. In fact, there's a great deal of evidence now from the scientific world that shows that human beings are altruistic. It's in our DNA. It turns out that the human species is a stronger species if we help each other out. Also, I understand that we have in our brains these mirror neurons that respond to other people's feelings. So if we see someone who's in pain or who's joyous, the same neurons fire in our own brains. This is empathy. It's part of what makes us human. So what ethics does is to take this natural tendency we have to care about people and put it on a rational basis so it can work in the real world. Now as to this idea that human beings are self-interested only, we only care about ourselves, you know, we often attribute that idea to Adam Smith. Okay? Isn't he the guy who said that in a successful economic system, everyone should pursue his own selfish interest and it works out for the betterment of all as though guided by an invisible hand. Well, it's ironic we would attribute this view to Adam Smith because he staked his career on precisely the opposite view. He wrote a whole book called The Theory of Moral Sentiments in which he argued that human beings are motivated by empathy as well as self-interest. The very first sentence of that book states that proposition and he spends the rest of the book trying to defend it. Now, he did write a book called The Wealth of Nations in which he talks about the invisible hand and he says, yes, self-interest is an important engine for an economic system, but he also says self-interest is a danger to an economic system. His remedy was government regulation. I'm not necessarily agreeing with him, but that's what he said. And in fact, as soon as he finished writing the book, he quit his job as an academic at the University of Glasgow and became a government regulator. So that's Adam Smith. Now, it wasn't his idea either. It goes back a long way. There's this guy, Meng Tzu or Mincius, as we say, who was a disciple of Confucius. This is more than 2,000 years ago. He argued that human beings are altruistic by nature. In fact, he used the, the following example. Suppose you're walking down the street and you see a, a young child about to fall into a deep pit. And you decide, what should I do about this? Well, what do you do? Do you think it over? Say, well, you know, if I walk past, someone may see me ignore the child, they may get in trouble. Or if I try to save the child, I may be late for my next meeting. No, you don't do that. You rush over and save the child. It's just part of who we are as human beings. That was his argument. Now, what is the job of ethics? Well, I mentioned it's to put this natural tendency we have to care about people on a rational basis. It builds rational consensus as to how we're going to take care of each other and live together in a harmonious way. We have to agree on the ground rules to get anything done. We have to have prior agreement. Now you may think, well, why can't we just take a vote on how we're going to do things? Well, suppose we take a vote. 
do we agree that we should abide by the vote? Well, maybe we should take a vote as to whether we're going to abide by the result of the vote. Well, what counts as majority rule? 51%, two thirds? Should we take a vote on that? So what counts as a majority rule for that vote? Well, you see the infinite regress. At some point, we have to have a prior understanding as to how we're going to live together. This is what ethics is for, to generate this rational consensus as to how we live together. Now, we often think it's really the law enforcement system that makes society work, right? Ethics is nice. It's nice to be ethical. But the really dirty work is done by law enforcement to keep us in line. Actually, it's just the opposite. It's just the opposite. So think about it. Suppose that tomorrow morning, everyone in town started running red lights. What can the police do about this? Are they going to have a cruiser stationed at every intersection in the city? Well, how many intersections? Well, there's thousands of them, not nearly enough police. OK, they're going to have cameras to photograph everyone running red lights. What are they going to do with those images? Are they going to send a citation to 500,000 people and collect the fines every day? I don't think so. Right? So if everyone's running red lights, there's nothing the police can do about it. Or suppose tonight, everyone starts breaking into apartments and houses. Can the police stop it? Can the police be everywhere at once? No. There's no way. Okay? The law is there to take care of a few people on the fringes who don't get the message. It's not going to work unless most of us voluntarily comply. And we can't voluntarily comply unless we agree on what we ought to be doing. This is why we have ethics to bring about that agreement. Now, let me take you through some myths about ethics that get in our way. The first one is that, well, you learn your ethics when you're a little kid. Now it's too late. So I'm wasting your time. This is absolutely wrong. There's a whole field that's called developmental psychology that deals with this. And this field has discovered that people become more ethical as we become more mature in general. As our cognitive ability increases, our ethics increases. In fact, I edited a journal, and one of the members of my board has found in research that successful leaders are better at ethical reasoning than the average person because they've reached that level of maturity where they know how to take into account everyone's point of view and come to a resolution. So we actually grow ethically as we grow in other ways. This guy, Lawrence Kohlberg, asserts that you continue to grow ethically even to your 60s. It's a lifelong process. And ethical instruction and training is part of that process. So, so much for that myth. Another one, myth number two. Sitting in class doesn't change anyone's behavior. It's incentives out there that change behavior. We're wasting our time sitting in class. Well, if that's true, let's shut down the business school, right? Why are we sitting in class in this building? It's because we believe that learning something will change your behavior because you'll learn how to accomplish your goals. It's the same in ethics, same thing. Myth number three, I hear this a lot from academics. Okay. We already know what's right. It's obvious what you shouldn't be doing, what you should be doing. It's just a matter of doing it. Okay? So we don't need to waste our time talking about ethics. We already know what we should be doing. If that's true, then why do we disagree all the time? In fact, every single issue I present to a group, people disagree over. Every single one. Well, it can't be obvious if we all disagree. Right? It's not obvious in many cases. Now, the big one, myth number four. This is the hardest one to deal with. Ethics is just a matter of opinion. It's just a matter of personal values. It's not like chemistry or physics. There's no objectivity in this field. Okay, it's just a matter of my values versus yours. Well, try to remember this the next time you're mugged. The mugger has his values, you have yours. Okay? Or an example I sometimes use with my students. You know, suppose I return your essay with a C minus. And you ask, why did I get a C minus? I thought it was good. And I say, well, I don't like your looks. And you say, well, that's not fair. And I say, well, that's your opinion. I have my opinion. I think it's fair. So I can tell you, I've done ethics workshops in several countries. 
And the U.S. is the trickiest place in the world to discuss ethics. It's because we have this dual personality. On the one hand, we say we're relativists. Ethics is a matter of opinion and personal values. But at the other hand, we're the most absolutist people in the world. We think that our way of life, democracy, free markets, human rights, and so forth, should be everywhere. And our presidents go around the world saying, quote, our values are universal. That's a direct quote from the last two presidents. So we have this bifurcated approach to ethics. I don't think anyone really believes that ethics is a matter of opinion. But we tell ourselves that, and it gets in our way. Ethics is not about personal values. It's about interpersonal values. Otherwise, it can't do its job. Remember, the job of ethics is to bring us together, to put us on the same page to generate rational consensus. So if it's only about personal values, it's not going to work. It's not going to do its job. That's why it has to be interpersonal. This is the way that Western civilization has approached ethics for about 2,300 years. We build rational consensus by convincing each other that we shouldn't run red lights, we shouldn't break into houses. Now, perhaps we haven't convinced each other we shouldn't break the speed limit. Okay? So why do we all break the speed limit? Because we don't agree with it. We don't think it's necessary to drive 55 miles an hour on I-79. So we drive 75 miles an hour. We basically obey the laws we agree with. So ethics has to bring us to agreement somehow. We have a long legal tradition, something called common law, contract law, law of torts, and so forth, in which we come to an agreement about what's a fair way to resolve disputes, right? The loser has to agree with the ground rules as well as the winner. And you may say, well, ethics is really based on religion. And how can we come together on religion? Well, if you look at the great religious traditions, whether it be Islam, Christianity, Judaism, they have a long and sophisticated tradition of ethical reasoning. It's been rationality-based for centuries in these religions. And that's helped us to come together on ethical rules. What's happened to us in the meantime? We've forgotten how to do this. We have forgotten how to persuade each other rationally. We mix our ethics with emotion and ideology, and what do we get? Polarization. We don't know how to come together anymore. We've forgotten this age-old tradition of ethical reasoning. So let's bring it back. Let's get started. Now, oh, some tips for how to approach ethics in an objective way without getting your emotions wrapped up in it. First tip, remember that ethics doesn't judge people, it judges actions. The purpose of ethics is not to decide whether you're a good person or a bad person. Okay? It decides whether you're about to do a good act or a bad act. It gives you advice on what is the rational choice. It's a bit like a golf lesson, right? So if your golf instructor tells you your wrist is a little too stiff, you need to swing this way, you know, you don't take that personally. You don't assume he's telling you that you're an inferior person because your wrist is not right. He's just giving you some advice about what, how to do it next time. This is what ethics does. It's not about your worth as a person. I'm not here to judge you. I'm certainly not capable of it. And maybe there's some higher power that can judge us. But ethics doesn't do that. It simply tells us what to do next time. So what I'm aiming for here is a kind of professional distance, right? If you're making an investment. You don't want to get your emotions wrapped up in whether it should be stocks or bonds. You want to look at the evidence, look at the arguments objectively. That takes some discipline, some training. It's the same in ethics. Maintain that professional distance. Another reason we should do that is so we can be leaders. You know, leadership is to a great extent building consensus, getting everyone on the same page, moving in the same direction. This is exactly what ethics does, remember? Rational consensus. So leadership and ethics are very closely connected, and it's not going to work unless we can maintain distance from the issue so as to see everyone's point of view and put it all together. Finally, you've got to know how to do it. You've got to know how to analyze the ethical issues. So that is what we're going to start doing in the next session. Thank you very much.